we use a multi we use a multi-step goal achievement framework of play do review and it's a permanent process of plan do review and we also apply an activity tracker to see if we get out of our activities practices games classroom sessions what we planned or targeted and all this we do under the motto do you think or do you know we try to base our program on science on data or on hard facts so in this perspective my colleague as a learn to play developer thomas parrich of the charles university in prague um, he took kind of first step in evaluating the outcome of different game formats and he quoted it's not easy to come to a clear conclusion but one thing is very clear, five on five full ice is by far the worst format for development. So the game format analysis as it is done by the Finnish and the Swedish Federation and presented today was conducted with the latest technology and is way more advanced and uh, extended. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our presenters of today. So two experts in youth hockey development from Sweden, Anders Wallström. Anders is youth and junior manager for the Swedish Association. And from Finland, Kalle Valiau. Kalle is the youth hockey manager for the Finnish Association. Welcome, Kalle. Welcome, Anders. And thank you for sharing your experience and information. Before handing over to our presenters, if you have any questions to our presenters, you can post those as we normally do in the chat box or use the raised hand function, and we will address the questions at the end of the session. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. I will share the presentation. Just give me a second. Thank you, Johan. It's a pleasure to be in presenting this topic to all of you. So good to be here. Welcome, gentlemen. So here we go with the presentation. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Johan, for the presentation, and, and hi, everybody. Um, as Johan said, me and Kalle are going to present what we've done studying the, the, the game format when it comes to Chadi Youth Hockey. Uh, we have a couple of slides. We um, will try to, to take turns on who will speak to each slide. Uh, we have a plan. Uh, let's see, Kalle, if we can stick with it or if we need to, to talk to each other amongst the, the way here. Um, Johan is the one who has um, behind the, the scenes when it comes to switching the slides. So I, I guess we just tell you when to, to switch, Johan. Is that okay? That's okay. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> we we would like to start with this picture um, to kind of frame what this is all about. I mean. Chadian Youth Hockey is all about uh, education and, and the development of, of players who, who hopefully and sometimes will, will be in this kind of context, uh, that will say elite level. Uh, we know when studying uh, modern hockey at the senior elite level, it's, it's mostly and very, very often played on uh, small areas. Uh, in this picture, uh, for example, we have all the 10 players uh, on this small piece of, of area. Uh, and one thing that we would really, really try to do, find out is, is how do uh, hockey for, for kids and, and the younger youth look like uh, to prepare them uh, in the best way possible uh, for this kind of, of ice hockey. Uh, I don't know if you want to say something about this picture, Kalle, even though it's Sweden against Canada on the picture. Yeah, in, in our game, you know, our, our players are so far apart, so we couldn't find any picture from this. But yeah, I, I guess what Anders was also saying, you know, it's about reading the situation, and act over there, be aware of what's going on on the ice and make decisions according to that. I think that's the key element when we talk about youth development that I think our job is to teach our kids to read the game, see the game, make decisions over there and be creative and not just following how five players units should play. You know, it's all about those quick decisions on the ice. And we can say, while we're still at this picture, that we, 
at least in Sweden, we tried for, for several years to, to promote small area games. Uh, and some of the clubs and, and some of the coaches has done it a lot in, in practice. Uh, but we believe strongly that the coaches, they, they are going to coach the system. So if we can change the game, uh, the way the, the games are structured and played, uh, the chance is, is big that the coaches are going to do even more small area games during practice sessions as well. So that's also one of the whys behind this. Uh, we, we can't just educate coaches uh, on how to, to do this. We need to change some structures. And both we and Finland uh, has done, done something like that. Uh, what we did in Sweden was that we, uh, we, need, we, we had a um, kind of a, uh, what do you call it, hypothesis uh, on what we were looking for. Uh, and we thought that uh, the younger the kids, uh, the smaller the, the, the areas. Um, so we tried to find out what would be the most appropriate uh, way to play when it comes to U8, U10, U12, and U14 players. And, and Finland uh, looked at two, two different ways, U10, U11, and U12. And we will guide you through what we um, find, found out during the sessions. Uh, we have some pictures down below that are some companies that we, we cooperated with uh, to, to uh, do the findings that, that we now have. Uh, and we're of course very, very thankful that uh, the technology is there today. That makes it quite, quite easy to, uh, to get data. Uh, and as Johan said, it was important for us that we didn't just guess us uh, the way forward. We, we, really, we really, really wanted to know um, a lot more on, on this. So you can switch the, the slide, Johan. Uh, these are the, the game formats that we uh, collected data from. Uh, in Sweden, we, we played on, on one sixth, one fourth and one third uh, and full ice. And, and we played three and three, four and four, five and five on all those areas uh, and all the four ages, U4, U8, U10, U11, uh, U12, U14, as I said. Uh, and maybe you can say something about your measurements, Kelly. Yeah, as, as you are able to see, so some of the areas we did together and then we have some difference and between the countries. So we were looking for similar things but we decided to set up these smaller games form as a bit different way as as Anders was saying previous that the Sweden was looking for uh, what is the optimal uh, small area for the youth and our our point of view was think about how these games differs from each other or do they differ from each other each other and how you can compare these different smaller games comparing the full ice, full ice five on five hockey. And there's some in the study, you're able to see some definitions of when we're talking about NS means that we are playing direction north to south. Or when we talk about east west, it means that you are playing cross size. So some, some definition measurements over there. So at the end, we were, we were having. 25 different game formats from different age groups from two against two until five on five. So we were, we were trying a lot of different variations yeah. by in our study. I can say that, that we, we have met a couple of times during these last couple of years to, to, to share the data and to, to learn from each other. And uh, at least from my point of view, Kelly, the, the cooperation has worked very well. Uh, Yes. So we were using different parameters. Uh, if you have read the study, of course, there are shooting and passes and pass receives, but we also were looking for, let's say, like shooting attempts. So whenever a skater, a player was trying to shoot or he did, did shoot the puck, but maybe he did miss the net or somebody plucked the puck, so we were counting those twos because we were looking for how, how skaters were executing the game. 
So we were not just watching the statistics, like, you know, how many saves there were for the goalie. So that's why there are some parameters are showed as a SAT, as a shooting attempts or PAV, like passing attempts. And of course, then we were able to measure skating speed and skating distance. Uh, in Sweden, with the catapult system, you were actually, they were actually able to measure the distance was traveled. In our case, we were actually, we had to estimate the distance which was traveled, but that was easy to count from the other measurements like speed average and so on. So there's a small variation in the study because of that. And then in our case, in Vaisaki system, the system has been built for the game that is played from south to north-south directions. It, it hasn't been built from east to west. So that's why we weren't able to get all the data out, even though the data is in the computers. But again, it's about cooperation with these companies to use to build, build up the system to be better in the future. And then at the end, of course, there's a lot of, in Sweden, there was one actions where calculated, like comparing those and actions, when we're talking about the actions, it means examples, shots, passes, puck battles. So again, how the skaters were actually executing the games over there. I can say that we, we did even have pulse meters on, on the, not on the smallest kids, but on the, at least from, from U10 and U12 and U14, I think we had pulse meters. Uh, and, and collected data with heat maps and everything as well. Uh, so so to, to be honest, we, we have um, a lot of data. Maybe we have too much data to, to have time to analyze it all. Uh, but if you can just show this uh, short film you're on, uh, that will, and then I just let the, the film run and then can speak to it also. Yeah. As you can see in the, on the computer screen uh, in the movie, uh, you can see that we had GPS trackers on the players uh, so that we could, could follow them um, through all the games, um, which was very, very important just to, to find out the data. Um, and as I said, we also later on had, had pulse meters on them to, to see if the, how the, uh, the pulse went up. Um, and as Kelly said, we, we could, with the GPS, count both the actions of the players uh, and the, the, the distance and speed of skating. So, we, um, as I said, we have a lot of data. Uh, we, have, we can probably do much more analysis from it. Um, but for now, uh, we have done enough so that we can trust the way that we are going to recommend our uh, districts and clubs to, to play uh, in the upcoming seasons. Here is uh, one video from the test event in, in Vieromäki. So all the games were, were filmed because we were able to go back and see what the actions were really are. So all the players, they had a chip inside the jersey. So we were able to track the players on live. And also we had a, there was a chip also in a puck. So we were able to see how the puck was moving and how fast it was going too. So you and you may show the, this video too. So we are playing here three on three and it's about one fourth of the ice playing east-west direction. So we were having these games in two rings at the same time and this ring was actually measured and the other one wasn't. So the players didn't know who had a cheat and who didn't have a cheat, but we were able to know that which players are having having chip too. So I guess in all, already in this video, you were able to see the actions that the kids were doing on the ice. Hmm. And before you start the film, you want to just speak some of this. Uh, as you can, this is from, from the Swedish data collection. One of the three times we, we collected data. This is one sixth of the full rink. Uh, and this time we're playing three on three, probably you, you eight. Uh, and as you, as you can see, we had some, some hats on them. 
uh, and those kids are, are focused players that played actually every single uh, game uh, during these measurements so that we could compare the same individuals and their uh, number of actions and, and distance um, compared to the different, different sizes and different game formats. Uh, so you can run the film. And one thing that we could see quite early when we looked uh, on the, the films, when we tried to find out, is it the, the games running smoothly? Uh, was that uh, some situations where uh, the kids, if they were playing on a bigger surface, especially on, on five on five full eyes, uh, the, the players that were mostly uh, developed, uh, so to speak, they would just take the puck and go and probably score on the other side. They, they need to, to be much, much smarter when they come to, to their decisions. And as Kalle said in the beginning, we, we are sure that these type of game formers will also uh, develop the, their understanding of the game, which, which, which is really, really important uh, at all ages, uh, both when it comes to, to, to the, the skill levels, but also when it comes to, to, to the player safety questions. I think you can switch it, right? Is it you and me, Kalle? Yeah, I can, I can continue. So uh, we had a plan, like, how do we analyze the results? We decided to do, do it that in Sweden, Swedish Federation did their own analyzing and we did our own. And I think that was a good decision to make so we weren't able to affect each other results so we were able to analyze our own data and as i said before we had to go through the videos again just to make sure that the, how the games were going maybe there was some actions that were recording as a playing time even though the puck wasn't involved so and then again, in our case, some parameters we couldn't get out when we we're playing east-west direction, so cross sides, because the system was built actually at, at the beginning to, to play game north-south direction in, in pro league. So that was something that we were doing. So again, we are getting a lot of data from the computers because the players were tracked, the puck was tracked, but then we had to do something manual work together. So and Putting those together, it was a it was a long run, but I think we got got a lot of data data, and there's a lot of data still available that need to be analyzed and and cannot and some data we cannot get out yet, but maybe in, maybe in the future. And here, when if you read the read the study, we are using also we we are using average numbers. And I think the average numbers gives us direction, you know, how the game are varying. But it's kind of like, it gives you an idea, like one, one size fits all idea. But then on the right side, we were also using these box plot figures. And in these box plot figures, you're able to see the individual difference in the game. So these small circles are those individuals in the game. So if you go down in, if you see down in the bottom, uh, you have the lowest numbers over there, and up in the end you have the highest number. What what gives you? And then inside the figure you're able to see kind of like this median value over there, and what is the maximum value over there? So I I think this kind of this kind of figure as a coach or as a developer gives you an idea. Like if you think all the individuals in the one game how much they actually differs over there there might be some outliers who are able to score a goal in every single game quite easily but it might be that the same single player is not able to score a goal in another game so i i think that's the one key thing over here when we are reading the reading the results that we we understand that what is the average number but we understand 
that the individuals are different already in under nine or under 10 or under 14 age, age old. That's just a definition of a box plot. Yes, if we can look at some, some results from the different um, data collections. These are fr from our study in Sweden. Um, and as Johan mentioned uh, in the beginning, his introduction, uh, we can clearly see that for those these ages, um, five on five pool ice is, is not uh, the best, at least not when it comes to actions per player, which is what these numbers in the uh, right column shows. Uh, the, the higher the numbers, the more actions per player. Uh, we, we played the just five minute uh, games when we, when we uh, did the data collections. Um, and, and, it, and as Caleb mentioned, we had a lot of different parameters uh, that we uh, marked at, at, as actions. Uh, we, of course, have a lot of other data outbroken when it comes to the different parameters, but these are uh, the total numbers of uh, hockey action. Um, it can differ on what kind of actions um, there, there are. But uh, the most important thing for us was to, to get the numbers of uh, how involved are the players in the game, because we know from other studies, um, like the, the studies done with uh, Amanda Vistek when it comes to fun maps that have the Manics presented. Uh, I think it was in this context uh, for a few weeks ago. Uh, to be involved in the game and to, to be, uh, had a feeling of, of confidence and that you develop is one important parameter that they will stay in the game. So that had been one uh, action point for, for us uh, to make sure that the, the kids are really, really involved. Uh, and they are more involved, of course, uh, the fewer the players that are uh, in the rink at the same time, and the tighter the, the surface is. And we'll come back a little bit more to, to speak about what we saw when it comes to three on three versus four on four and five on five. So I think I'll leave that for now. Um, Here's uh, overall results from Finland as a, as a player average number. So again, there's a, you're able to see these different games, uh, how many players were on the ice, and what is the area of the uh, area of the small area games. So even though if you if you're watching these passing attempts per minute, that let's say in in top over there is 2.9, that means that in in 60 seconds or so one minute shift, there's 2.9 total passes in the game or passing attempts. But then if you're watching that, what that does mean for a single player, you are able to see that it's 0 0.3 passing attempts in a minute for a single player. So now if you're watching these results, think about these passing attempts per minute per player, you're able to see that three on three, half eyes north, south, long, you, every single player is able to get at least one. And then at at the bottom, you, when you play two and two, one four of north south, the result is one point six. So again, when you're when we're watching these average results, you're able even you might see what is the results for the whole game, but then when you put that down in what that really means is as a single player, that gives you an idea like how many passing attempts or shooting attempts there are in a minute. And next slide will be uh, an example as a box plot figure. So there's a shooting attempts from our, our games in Finland. On the left side, you're able to see kind of like when you're talking about shooting attempts, kind of like the worst games, if you, are, if you want to emphasize shooting attempts in the game. And most of them are five on five games so there are too many players playing either in the full ice or a, a bit longer smaller area and then on the right side you're able to see that there are already games that if you just check the lowest result every single player is is able to get more than zero result so again those games two on two one eight of the ice or three on three one of the eight, eight of the ice gives a player more opportunities more opportunities for having a shooting attempt in the game. 
So when you're watching these box plot figures, then from if you're watching from left to right, on the right side, you're able to see the games that gives more opportunities for players either to, to have a shooting attempt or a passing attempt when you're watching the actual study. So when, when it comes to the process from, from start to, 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 to finish, or actually not the finish, but to the point where we are, where we are today. I mean, as you see, we, we did a lot of data collections uh, during uh, 2019. Uh, and um, we, we, it took longer than we expected to put all the data together. As, as we said, we had a, a lot of data uh, and the, the corporation got some obstacles in the way when the pandemic came. So we need to, to find other ways to, to, to meet. Um, and then we had, at least in Sweden, the, the last season where we were try, where we were planning on, on launching all this uh, and try this uh, kind of game formats uh, that did, we didn't get mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. um, so, so we're gonna take this from, from uh, where we are today, uh, this upcoming season, but I think we'll speak a little bit more about that uh, in some coming slides. I don't know, Kelly, if you want to compliment on this something. Yeah, I think, yeah, when we start, start to do this process together with Sweden, I think we had a good run. We were able to meet each other before the pandemic started. And then after pandemic started, we were able to do a lot of stuff online too. And I think we had a really good relationships and we were going forward together. And I think that that was a great thing about the cooperation and partnership between two countries to have a same goal to study this important topic in, in youth hockey. And, you know, we were running test events and after test events, we had a reflection time together and, you know, we were go going through what went well and what to think about when, we or Sweden actually run the event, so we were a lot, we were sharing a lot of knowledge during the process already. Even though over here it's only like four sentences, like how the actual timeline went, but we we put a lot of effort effort here together. Yeah. And then uh, when think about the summary, and you know, always you need to reflect like what we actually learn from this. You know, if you just play 60 seconds without any rule restriction, if you just play a game and if you want to emphasize shooting, maybe two on two, one eight of the eyes might be the best best way to do it. If you just want to, want to emphasize shooting, if you want to do emphasize passing, two on two, one four of the north south game was the best result from our side. But again, same time understanding or knowing that even though we did 39 different events, uh, most of them had a zero result for players. So only 10 or 10 plus games were able, we were able to create a situation where players were getting better than a zero result. Then if you want to emphasize skating speed and distance, you put the nets far, far away from each other. And from our study, if you play two on two, half eyes playing, so half eyes divided in north-south way, that in Finland gave the best best result for, for our players. And then again, when you analyze box plots and average results, you know, understand what is the difference. And when you really watch the box plots as, as, you, were, you, as you were seeing before, you're able to see the individual difference. So there's a lot of games that there, there's always a player who doesn't get any attempt. So who's not participating in the game. But same time, even though when we are collecting the data, we know how many opportunities there will be as a player, the role of a coach gets bigger. So the coach has to really understand what's going on there, how the individual is doing in the game. As you see in the right size, there's a picture about how long needed to needed 
how how many minutes needed to take a shot for a single player so now these numbers are playing numbers from the player so if you see number 65 it took about he was able to take always a shot in every minute but then for num player number 21 it took more almost half an hour to shoot a single shot in these events so again understanding that players are actually doing executing different things in the game and it might be that the game itself gives some demands for a player so if you just play a game and think about okay this game will provide shooting attempts you really need to you might add a rule over there to make sure that everybody is able to get that attempt over there so just a playing game without any rules might not give you the results that you're looking at you and you may change the slide and again average results gives an idea and then if you think about the activity in our results if you play if you play two on two or three on three more likely most players are active so but when you add number of players if you play four on four or five on five there are more and more players who are not active so if you're watching a five on five game and you see the results in these age groups you're able to see that there's a lot of players who are who are on the ice but are not active at all there are a lot of players there might be only a single player who's able to get that shot in the game and then we're when we're talking about the development ages we want to provide a lot of situations where kids are able to get these shooting attempts or passing attempts or game situation over there so again when you move the nets further away the end, then you get more skating speed speed and distance and then if you get if you move nets closer to each other you're able to provide more shooting and passing attempts and game actions as you were seeing the results from from sweden can, can i put and again, that, something? can i just fill in color please uh, please <clears throat> Uh, when it comes to, um, we compared a lot when it comes to, to three on three games or four on four games, and, and we could see a, a clear difference on, on the same focus players uh, once they played four and four uh, and, and they, they weren't at the same skill level as their uh, teammates. The, the fourth player was isolated and, and its actions grades went, went dramatically down. Uh, the same player while playing three on three. Uh, needed to, to be involved in the game and, and took more plays and had more uh, actions uh, when it comes to, to shooting attempts, body contact, uh, actually on, on every uh, every single uh, parameter that we measured. So, so that was one thing that we started to lean quite strongly towards just playing three on three, uh, as you can see uh, in some later sli slides here. Um, but that was, was so, so obvious that no matter of skill level at uh, the players, three on three and two on two are um, much more beneficial for, for those uh, kids uh, than playing four and four and five and five. And that was an important finding for, for us at least. And again, if you, and when you're reading these results as a coach, when you are building up your practice plan and you, when you set your goals, what you want to achieve from the practice, then you need to think about, okay, how do I make sure that the players are getting enough, let's say, shooting attempts. You may use a smaller game. There are a lot of good smaller games with some rules or restrictions which actually gives a player a lot of shooting attempts. But if you just drop the puck and let the kids play and you are thinking that there's a, there are going to be a lot of shots over there, it might not be quite true. So again, when you're building up your practice, when you're planning your practice, you might use some other drills too. Technique drills, game-like drills, some drills that if you want to emphasize shooting or scoring skills over there. But again, in, in, in our study, when we were analyzing the videos of the games, we were able to see a lot of actions. We were, we were able to see a lot of body contact situ situations over there. Players had to keep their head up. They had to be aware of what was going on the ice. So as a player safety perspective, smaller games are great on that too, because you get a lot of natural contact, 
contact your perception skills are developing over there and then in the first picture what Anders was showing the Sweden against Canada the pro players were in a small area keeping their head up they have to be aware what's going on on the ice so again beneficial when you're when you use smaller games for playing surface or practice surface we may continue yeah uh, how do we did we then use the results to, to develop uh, and where, where are we right now um, we can switch to the next slide John uh, but before I will comment on this I will just emphasize what, what Akala was saying about the coach's role uh, we can see we strongly believe I should say that uh, it's more important that we have well-educated coaches that really, really understand the, the, the purpose of their role. Um, it's much easier to manipulate the games when it comes to, to small areas uh, and the fewer players, the easier it is. Uh, so if you want to, if it's important for you as a coach to, to, to win the games or win the, the, the tournament, um, it's, it's much easier to, to manipulate it. Uh, so we need to work really, really hard with the coaches at these levels to understand the, the why we do this and that it is about player development. It's about the, the long-term uh, player development. And it's not about, uh, at least for the coach, to, to, to do all they can uh, to, to win each game. I mean, it's up to the players to, to, to score more goals than, than the opponents, but uh, the coaches need to have another focus, a much more long-term focus. And that's probably, and hopefully, uh, obvious for all of us, but, but um, it's easier for them to, to manipulate uh, when it comes to small areas. Um, what we are trying right now, we had a, a season that just uh, got passed uh, and we we're going to keep on trying uh, the upcoming season to play from at the level U9 and below. We're going to play three on three um, on one sixth of the, the full rink, uh, European measurements. Uh, and when we do that, we, we are able to, to have four games going on at, at the same time. Um, the, the players that are um, on the bench, they can, can be in the, the middle zone, uh, just waiting for, for their shift. Um, and when it comes to, to U11 and U10, we're going to play one fourth of the ring, still three on three. Uh, and with uh, the bench players uh, also in the middle zone. And we can also, when we try that, sometimes we we put up some uh, obstacles in the middle zone uh, where they could, could skate and move, move around and, and play with the pack uh, while they were waiting for their turn to, to play. Um, and that worked out quite well when we played on one fourth because we have so much space in the middle to, to do some, some other stuff. Um, and then when it comes to U12, we play on, on one third of the, of the ring size. And we, we still play three on three. And as I said, the reason that we choose to to do that is that we can really see that the the, the change the difference between between three and three and, and four and four when it comes to the players that are uh, not at the same skill level uh, differs so much. Um, so so here we are right now, um, and to make it easier for for our clubs and our players and our coaches to 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 do this, we we also did quite a big work with with the rule book you can switch the slide you are uh, so we can we try the, the last season we're going to keep on trying it uh, keep on evaluating it at the upcoming season uh, a rule book or a framework for uh, these ages that, we, that i just showed and we have actually just seven rules right now uh, one rule about teams one about game management, one about game time, uh, how we start the play when the pack get out of bounds or if, if there's a goal scored, uh, some rules about physical contact, some rules when it comes to, to, to penalties, uh, when it comes to illegal play or, or inappropriate behaviors, and some rules when it comes to goal scoring. Um, if you don't know Swedish, uh, I think I have this framework in, in, in English uh, that we could uh, share on our uh, website as well. Um, and it's been really, really helpful. It, it, it was a, quite a hard process in the beginning um, when we started to, to look into the big rule book where we have, as you know, uh, far over uh, 100 rules to find out how will we make it simple for the coaches, the refs, uh, and the, the players to, to, 
to enjoy the game. Um, but we're still in an evaluation phase of all this uh, and the upcoming season, we're gonna have uh, 15 of our 22 districts are gonna play these game formats uh, fully. Uh, and we're gonna be able, hopefully, if the, the pandemic doesn't hit us again, uh, to evaluate each and every rule to see if they will, will stick or if we need to make some uh, different cha changes in, in, in this. And another thing you wanted to switch to the slide, uh, we also uh, put up some, some dividers or, or boards um, to use while playing these game formats uh, that are very, very appreciated out there. Um, I think we have boards out in 117 uh, ice rinks uh, the last season and we're gonna put out the same numbers as the upcoming season. And it's all about making it easier for them to, to, to arrange these, these events, because uh, all of these events are, are played where several clubs come comes in and over a day or two, uh, they, they play a lot of games. Uh, and these boards are, are easy to store, easy to, 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 to put out on the ice and put off the ice. And they can be used both in, in, uh, in practice and in, in games. Uh, and gladly, we hear a lot of reports from, from, from our clubs that even the, the elite level uh, players use these boards uh, to divide the, the, the rink where they play small area games or if they uh, uh, put up some other uh, constraints uh, while deciding practices. And I'll say a good question. These, these devices are, are, are soft. Um, so that's where we are in Sweden right now. In our, our federation, according to this study, we, we decided to change our game formats too. So our under eights and under tens, they have only smaller, smaller games. They used to have only smaller games, but we only had like one, one single game for them. So now they actually have three different variations over there. So the idea is that we maximize the ice time for the kids. And then it depends on the event, you might play half ice or you may, might play one fourth of the ice or one third of the ice. So providing a different environments already in the early ages. Then we used to play only full ice starting up under 11 and up. But now in under 11, 50% of the league games are playing three on three cross size one third of the ice and under 12 30 percent of the league games are playing also with the same formation and rest of the games are playing full ice so these kids are playing in different two different environments in in our leagues then in under 13 and under 14 there's only full ice games but then as, as a player safety perspective face-to-face -face checking situations are restricted so the player has to be aware of the puck and the player. So there has to be also an action to get the puck away, not just not just smashing one player over there. So kind of like progression over there. How do how do we have built this these things for the whole whole country? And we had it last year and we are going to continue this year too. And then of course, when you make some changes, you have to ask feedback. So because of the pandemic, we did the, we only did the feedback sessions with our skill coaches over there. So we were asking different questions and they had to rank it from zero to five. We had the five is the best result. What, what was the feeling of the skill coaches? Was this a good idea? bring these smaller games in the league game. So the average result was 4.5. So all, almost, almost the best result that you're able to get in whole Finland. Uh, what they were thinking about the ratio between smaller games and full ice, they felt that it was a good, good ratio when under 11s were playing 50% and under 12s were playing more, uh, 30%. Some of them were saying that there should be more 
some of them were saying that maybe a bit less, but again, getting a result number four out of this after first year, I think it, it was a great result. Only, and this is not a bad result either, 3.7, like how, how's the organizing or what's the organization of the smaller game event? So the only feedback that we got out of as a negative side was how to organize and how to run the event. But again, it was the first year that we did it in the middle of pandemic. So again, that came some, it, there was, that's why there was some already some restrictions in different areas in Finland, like, you know, how to organize and are you, are you able to play a game? So I think that gave also some addings over here. So again, the feedback after the first year was, was great. And next year, if we are able to run kind of a normal year, a normal season for every team, then we are going to add, add coaches to and and our coaching directors of, of the club. So we are able to we are able to get some more feedback from there. Yes, yeah, so when it came to, to our evaluation, as, as Kalle said, I mean, it was the same as Sweden. We weren't able to play as many games as we uh, would like to, but, but we, we, we got to play some at least. Um, and when we spoke to the coaches that were involved, uh, the first quarter, uh, I never thought it would work out this well. The kids were really loving it. Uh, it was interesting because when we did the, the data collections and interviewed the kids, uh, we got a quote that one kid said that uh, this, this wasn't as much fun as I thought because I didn't get so much time with the pack. Um, and I thought that's one of the things that we really would like to, 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 to aim for, that the, the, the time with the pack won't be that uh, that long, so they need to to move on quickly, make make quicker decisions. Uh, but once they tried and they had played several games, they, they were loving it because uh, they were so involved in the game. Uh, they had so many more actions. Uh, so so no doubt that the kids uh, are going to like it. Uh, one experience that we did was that we should not force anyone back. Once they are used to play five on five on full ice, it, it probably not uh, a smart idea to, to, to force them back to play on, on small area games uh, the whole season at least. Uh, so, so in our districts that have played, uh, in our opinion, too early five on five on full ice, we're gonna just let them go and start to, to implement the new game formats uh, in the younger ages. So we will have some district that the upcoming season will, will play uh, five on five full eyes at, at U12. But from the season 22, 23, uh, all the districts in Sweden will be in, in, in phase, so to speak. Uh, another quote that we got from a coach was uh, the second one. When we look at the, all the actions that per player, we should consi to consider to play some game like this up uh, even at the age of U14. And if we just should look at the data, uh, it's no doubt that even U14 and U13 players should play uh, on, on small area games, not only in practice, but probably at least on, on some games uh, during a season, because uh, it's going to benefit their, their development. Uh, but for, for political reasons, I think we, we needed to, to, uh, to put a line um, when it comes to U12 players and, and let the U13 and 14 play on full ice. But uh, we are doing some events uh, when they play three on three, even at these ages, uh, this upcoming season. And as Kalle said, when it comes to, 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 uh, to the events and the arranging of the events, uh, one comment that we had was that it's hard for, for the clubs to come up with enough coaches uh, when we play on four uh, four surfaces at the same time, um, but I think it pro would probably be a good way to to involve more parents uh, that could be standing there uh, just to make sure sure that the the, the changes of the players uh, during a game mo moves and and works out well. Uh, so I think it's when once they get used to it, they can. The, this would be a possible possible way to, to uh, involve more parents in 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 the, in the kids' games. Um, we also got some comments when it comes to the, to the the refs and their role, uh, where they had some adjustment problems with the new rules and everything. But we have been clearly all the way that we do this to to uh, 
to, to uh, develop the players in a better way. Uh, if we have some problems with, with the grown-ups when it comes to coaches or the grown-ups when it comes to the refs, uh, we need to, to find solutions for that. Uh, we can't um, make the, the, the kids' development uh, suffer from, from the problems that the grown-ups have. Um, the last co quote is that we, uh, without minus shots at the goal, we need to switch that positions more often than, than before. Uh, so we, we are quite sure that we need to come up with uh, some, some really, really high quality, quick change gold equipment uh, that will, will uh, work out well because uh, some of the goalies were really, really tired at the end of the game, even though the games were quite short. Uh, they had so many shots on them um, and they took too long uh, when, when they didn't have, have a quick change equipment. So, so, so I think... Uh, that's one thing that we need to, to keep on developing. Uh, we are also looking, we, we never mentioned that in our presentation, but we are also right now measuring uh, smaller nets to see what size uh, that um, would, would be both beneficial for, for the goalie development and the goal scoring. So that's both sides of the, of the coin, so to speak. Uh, and we have some debate in Sweden, at least, on uh, which way we should, should move. So we're right now collecting data uh, on two different net sizes to see which, at least from, from data perspective, will be the best ones. Yes. Thank you. And here's the, here's the link for the actual study that it's, you're able to see it from the IHF, IHF web page from the development hub. Okay, thank you, Kala. Uh, I have some questions for Anders and for Kala. If you have questions, you can still uh, put them in the in the in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, to to kick off, Anders, if we want to implement those small formats, what would you suggest? Where to start, and and what are the key success factors to keep in mind to to get start off with these small formats? Oh, I think what we did at least was to work uh, really, really a lot with our um, uh, our, our political landscape, so to speak, to get our, our board members in our districts to, to, to really, really see the benefits from this, to, to get them to, to understand why uh, and let them join in their pace, uh, not to force them to, to, to too quick. Uh, but now on Friday, we have our annual meeting and, and hopefully we have a decision where we're going to play in these game formats uh, in the whole nation from uh, the season 22-23. But I think a key factor is uh, to, to, to have patience, uh, to, to work with the communication and the arguments. Uh, we also put up a, a communication kit that we sent out to all our clubs who played these game formats the last season where they get some, some information folders for parents, some posters to, to set up in the, the, the ice rinks and the, the locker rooms, uh, some, some coffee cups with, with some sayings on that, uh, that help them with, uh, also with a QR code that took them into ho our, our homepage. So I think uh, political uh, work uh, and, and communication are the keys. Okay, thank you. Got it. I have only a couple of kids, as, as might be the case in, in smaller MNAs. Uh, I have under eight, under 10, under 12 playing together or, or practicing together. What kind of format or approach would you recommend? Practicing and playing together in different age groups. Yeah, because that's the case. They only have a couple of under eights. They only have a couple of under tens and maybe a couple yeah. of under 10. They have to grow the game, but we see a clear report in age categories, which are fixed and clear. But if you only have a couple of, of kids, what, what could you do? I think number one thing is let the kids play. So I, I think in those ages, you shouldn't worry too much about the age, age group. So again, in, in a country where you have players, I think the most th one thing is to create the event and think about how many players you will get on the ice and then how do you maximize the ice time over there. If you only have, if you have only six players on, on the ice, then you can create different games for them. Because I, I think at the end, in the development years, and those are the years to develop, and 
of course it's longer, but I think it's to maximize the opportunities for player when, when they're learning the game. So I, I think you shouldn't worry too much about the age. Uh, if you have a really some cases, if there's a really big gap between the skills, maybe some of the games you organize according the skill level, but you don't need to organize all the games according to skill level. As, as Anders was saying, that when you play three on three, the environment, when you, when, when you have different skill levels also on dice, it's, it's also beneficial for everybody over there. So it, it doesn't mean that you have to always to play against better players than you are, because you, know, you need to have games that you're playing an equal level. You might need to games that you, when you play against less skilled players, because then as a player, you need to act different way in those games. And uh, again, it's a different environment every time. And I think as a, learning a skill, that has been studied and that has been told that, you know, variability of the environment is kind of key thing over there. And one variability is about the skill level of the players too. Okay, thank you. Anders, you have, you have, you made a great job and great work. You provided the dividers, but I don't have the dividers. Am I screwed for life or is there still another solution? Uh, we haven't put up the, the, any, any, kind of that you, de that you need to use these dividers. It's an opportunity uh, for, for the clubs. Um, and and we, we connected with a Swedish company that have helped us uh, uh, produce this. Uh, and they are not that expensive, uh, which has been a key for us to, to, to manage to get so many boards out there. Um, but it's okay for, for the clubs if they have other kinds of uh, dividers to play, if it's a, a, a rope or anything. I mean, uh, the most important thing is that, that the kids will, will play and have fun and, and develop. Um, and we just want to, to make it easier for the clubs to do that, um, but but no, no need to. Um, can, can I comment on the question you, you said to Kalle, Johan? I think for, for it's, it's the small areas, of course, are uh, a good way to work for the smaller M&As. Uh, we also in Sweden have small clubs uh, with, with few players in each age group. And especially when it comes to girls' ice hockey, uh, we can already see that the small games formats are helping us grow the girls' game a lot. Because uh, you, you only need six girls uh, in different ages, maybe, uh, to, to, start, uh, to start playing hockey and start playing games uh, towards other, other teams. And, and that's uh, it's going to help us uh, for sure develop uh, the girls size hack as well okay yeah, and Thank then uh, for the for the dividers we didn't offer any dividers to our clubs so again as anders was saying our rule was to uh, just put us something over there it might be a rope it might be a small board it might be a bigger board just you know that kind of you create the space over there and again for our clubs to be creative and keep it simple Exactly. Kale, can, can you, you talked about this, this league games, 30% would be cross ice or this specific percentage. How do you organize that as it is like you have uh, in under 13 full ice and 30% of cross ice or, or half ice? How do you organize those 30% games? Is it part of competition or is it just games? So whenever people who are setting up the league games for those age groups, they when they put the full full uh, whenever they publish the year, they count okay when we we'll, we will have those smaller games. So usually in those ages, uh, they take ice between six and eighty minutes, depends on the place and depends on ring how much there's available to use the ice. And then it's kind of like it's a game day as as a full ice event. So if you have a smaller game, depends how much ice you have. You either play two period two games or you play three games you it, there's two game two teams coming up so you have team a playing against blue and team b playing against reds and then the other game will be team a playing against red and vice versa and if, if you play the third game the actually the clubs can organize and you know how to divide the players for the last game so it really depends on the eyes again so it, kind of like using the same minutes that you are using in the full ice game too. So again, 
try to keep it simple and maximize the ice time. Okay, we have a question from the group saying, can we play small or more than one game at the same time? And if so, isn't that too chaotic? I mean, we, we, we tried to play four games at the same time and it worked out quite well. Uh, it, it was a really, really fun event. Uh, we, we had some, some, some templates of how the, the, play, the other teams will, will rotate. Uh, they played the games, each game of one over 50 minutes. And then they had a few minutes to rotate, and then the next game started. Uh, it worked out quite well, and we had some some teams that were resting, and they even they did some things on the in the standings, so they just sat there watching the games. Um, and when we play one six to four places, we also had an obstacle course in the middle where the, the resting team were were playing around. Um, of course, it w was crowded, but uh, with good coaches. Um, I think it worked out quite well. Fun away. Yeah, and again, maybe, maybe, maybe first time it might be a bit more chaotic than the second time. So again, people who are organizing the events they learn more. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, same thing over here. We might have two games or three games or four games at the same time. So depends on again the situation over there, how many players we are bringing bringing in in the game. Thank you. Uh, when, when we were developing the three-on-three -three game, and as Anders already mentioned, we, we developed rules to keep the pace of the game high and to make it fun. It was about playing, not about punishing or penalizing players. Um, how, how do you educate your referees? Because in, in the Youth Olympic Games, we saw they had a totally different role. They were more on the ice as a game manager. How are you educating your referees and, and how is that working? I can start. Uh, we we, put, we came up with a, an education for for game managers, as we also call them, at least at the, the younger ages. Um, so we have a digital education that they, at the club level, go through, um, and, and we also rely quite a lot on the coaches in each team to, to help the game manager. And, and sometimes the coaches they share the game and they manage it uh, half the time each at least amongst the youngest kids. Uh, and that has also helped us to, to, to kind of um, lower the, uh, the intense of, the, of, of how, how important each game is for the coaches. I mean, it's, it's, for the youngest kids, it's a fun event where they, where they should play a lot and have uh, really, really fun. So, so if, if we make it too serious, uh, they will might get in that trap that is, uh, really, really serious as well. Yeah, we, we also cooperate a lot with our referee instructors. So whenever we came up with the rules or the, how to organize the event, we sat together and then we did it together. And then my job was to, was to inform my team, regional coaches and our skill coaches and people in the youth clubs. And then our regional uh, referee instructor, he was in charge of the referee instructing and educating over there with the same information. So it's all about sharing the information and presenting that everybody understands what it's all about. And, and overall, we really didn't get any negative feedback why we brought smaller games in our leagues. So because we had the data, we did present it, we informed a lot of people, different events, people understood, okay, it makes total sense. Okay. Uh, Anders, small question, because I know you have a really nice education program for parents, at least to have more parents on ice. Uh, you have those short sessions on evening or on Saturday. Can you just explain what you're doing there? Because if you play one sixth of the ice, you need more volunteers to, to, to manage or to run the games. Yeah, uh, we work to, to, to try to get the parents to, to also be, be a part of the, the, the development environment for the kids. I mean, they play a crucial role um, if the kids will, will develop and stay in hockey. So, so the closer they can get uh, to build relations with the coaches, to build re relations with uh, the other team staff, um, it will, will help the, the kids uh, in the long run. So, so we try to, to make sure that the, the team staff uh, aren't afraid of involving the, the parents to, to stand on the side just to make sure that the, 
that the switches between the players are, are, are going smoothly. Uh, and, and the parents appreciate it, that they can, they can do something uh, and not just sit on, the, on the, the standings and watching the game. And as I understand well, it's just an evening session of about one and a half hour. Yeah, it can be that, or it's a Saturday when, when the kids are playing eight games a day, and they can be in the, the, the rink the whole day. But for the parents, it's, it's nice to, to have a role, uh, to be involved, to, to mean something, and uh, not just to, to their, their kid, but, but to the team. We also had a question of if there is any data collected about the goalie development in this situation. You can go, Kale. Yeah, you, you can start. You're well going there. As I said, we, we're right now measuring different net sizes to, to see which will benefit the goalies most. Uh, we have two, two schools, as I can, can say, amongst our goalie coaches in Sweden. We have those who, who are really, really for a full net. Uh, so that the kids not too early play uh, just blocking the shots and, and play like an, an elite goalie right now. Um, they want them to, to be good at the skates. They want them to, to, to stand up a lot and, and do saves uh, with their hands. Um, and then at the same time, we have those who say, hey, we need smaller nets so that they, that they don't let in that many goals. Uh, but we're right in the middle of... Uh, looking deeper into the goal development. Uh, so, so we don't have that data right now. Yeah. When we're analyzing the games this year in actions, we were able to see that there are a lot of shots against the goal. So the goalies are getting more, more and more shots in smaller games comparing five on five full ice games. So they get a lot of actions too. Not a, we didn't get, collect that kind of data, at least we haven't done it yet, but that's what we noticed this year that the goalies get a lot of, lot of shots. So one point that actually one of our clubs was mentioning that by when playing smaller games, they have to have more goalies too, which is beneficial for the clubs too. So the more, more players are able to have a chance to be in the net. So that's why, because sometimes it has been a problem that when they turn 12 or 13, you only have one goalie. But now when we're playing smaller games, you might you need to have at least two goalies or two goalies for each team. So it's it, it's a positive thing over here. Yeah, and you Anders, you mentioned the quick change gear. So that makes it possible to make um, all the children try the position of a goalie. So you, you also rotate players as, as being a goalie? We, we yes, we, we really, really recommend our clubs to, to rotate uh, on, all, on all positions, um, even the goalie. Uh, at least at the youngest ages, uh, we would really like everyone to, to get a chance to try it. Uh, and, and if they like it, they can get more opportunities than those who, who doesn't like it. But at least they, they we want everyone to try. Um, and that's another argument that I didn't mention why, why, why we play three on three is that you, you didn't, you you don't get locked in the position of a defenseman or an offensive player. When you play three on three, you need to uh, naturally you rotate uh, all the time that you're going to play both offensive and defense roles. Um. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So for the participants, you can find the recordings very soon on uh, of the webinars in the webinar uh, page of the IHF website. So you go to the development hub you can scroll down to the quick links and then select webinars. So all the other skills for all webinars are there. As Kalle and Anders already mentioned, the study can be downloaded from the player development uh, uh, guide in our website. So it's, it's also on the IHF website. The full study is there. Uh, you just have to go in the player development guide. The next skill for all webinar is planned on Wednesday, June 23rd, also at four o'clock. As you know, we think that recruitment is the building stone of all your events. And especially after Corona, we need to put attention to it. And already mentioned by Anders in his presentation, it's, it's, it's very important to do some recruitment but it's also very important to have a, a quality program behind it because it's not only about getting new players in, it's also about uh, how good is your program to keep them in. So the Swiss Federation is willing to present their recruitment program and they have a unique uh, quality management system. So that will be 
the topic for the 23rd of June. So to conclude, I want to thank our speakers, Kalle and Anders, for a great presentation and their hard work and contribution. And also thank you all uh, for your attention and your time. Hope to see you on June 23rd. Thank you.